self-righteousness, they say, is always the small self. So when I'm feeling up on my high horse, that's usually an indication of where I'm coming from. So I try and try to monitor that and not act on that. But a lot of it really is about how we treat other people. I'm an old 12-stepper, and they used to say, look for the good or the God in everybody. That's a high spiritual teaching. It's so simple. Anybody can do it. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure to have Paul Selig back with us. Paul is considered to be one of the foremost spiritual channels working today. In his breakthrough works of channeled literature, I am the Word, the Book of Love and Creation, the Book of Knowing and Worth, the Book of Mastery, the Book of Truth, the Book of Freedom, and the Beyond the Known Trilogy, Realization, Alchemy, and the Kingdom. Author and medium Paul Selig has recorded an extraordinary program for personal and planetary evolution as humankind awakens to its own divine nature. Paul was born in New York City, received his master's degree from Yale. A spiritual experience in 1987 left him clairvoyant. As a way to gain a context for what he was beginning to experience, he studied a form of energy healing and began to hear for his clients. Described as a medium for the living, Paul has the unique ability to step into and become people his clients ask about, often taking on their personalities and physical characteristics as he hears them telepathically. Paul's work is widely featured in a variety of media, including ABC News Nightline, Fox News, the Biography Channel series, The Unexplained, Gaia TV's Beyond Belief, and the documentary film PGS, Your Personal Guidance System. He's appeared on numerous radio shows and podcasts, including Coast to Coast AM and Bob Olson's Afterlife TV. Paul, it's so great to have you back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I was curious, have you ever done a children's book or are you considering it? Absolutely not. I don't, you know, I don't write the books. You know, I sit there in a chair and I close my eyes and I hear the darn book and I speak what I hear and that's what gets printed without editing. So I, I would not do that. It's, if my guides wanted to do that, I suppose they would. I, I don't imagine that they would somehow, because I think so much of their teaching is about being in choice. And I think, you know, to do this kind of work that the guides are teaching requires choice and, and the ability to discern. And I think that comes with some time and experience. How often are you hearing your guides talk to you? Is it all day long? Is it just when you... Uh, make a request like, hey, I want to channel uh, another book or the next chapter or w w how does that work? Well, I mean, it, there seems to be an agreement that if I know that I'm going to work, they're going to be there. So I, I channel a lot. I mean, the books are the books. Those take a couple of months usually of, of sittings to complete. Um, I do a five-day intensive online every month and a weekly channeling and, and I tour some so the agreement seems to be that if I show up at the appointed time, they're going to be there as well. I mean, they haven't stood me up yet, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. When I see clients and do my readings, I'm working a little differently. The guides may pipe in, you know, with commentary, but it's a different way of working. The psychic and the channel seem to be two different skill sets. And in my own life, most of the psychics and channels that I know, we don't really read for ourselves because it's a little risky, I think. The ego gets involved. I can be very neutral. If you ask me a question, I can be completely neutral as to the outcome. If I ask whether I'm going to get what I want, I have an investment in the outcome. So while I do tune in a fair amount, what I generally get from the guides in my own life is counsel on not making choices in fear. That's usually what I get that's effective. And, and it's of the moment. So I don't ask about the future. I don't get that stuff from myself. Mm. So what if you get this intuitive feeling that you should go to a particular, I don't know, specialist or doctor or get a, get a particular kind of a scan, medical scan. Are you consulting your guides and asking like, which specialist do I go to? Or can you give me more details on this and what's going on? Is everything okay with my health? No, I don't do medical readings. But even on yourself, like even if you get this feeling like I, I need to go to the doctor, I don't know why. I have a doctor that I trust. I would call my doctor. I would take his recommendations for referrals. I might tune into what feels best. Or knowing me, I would call up one of my friends who does this kind of work and said, okay, this is what's going on. What do you get on so-and-so? 
and I trade with people, you know, that I respect. So, you know, it's, it's part of the way that we navigate the shared field, because I think most of us agree that, uh, you know, sometimes another eye on something can be useful. Um, so, you know, I, when I, the first time I started, when I first started hearing for myself, I was getting ready to go to work at NYU. This is maybe 25, 30 years ago. I've always been a bit of a slob and I was going to go to work and I heard wear the blue shirt. I said, what should I wear? I heard wear the blue shirt, which was the only thing that was pressed in the closet. And I wore the blue shirt and that was the day I had to go meet with my boss unexpectedly. And I'm so glad I wore the blue shirt that didn't have the mustard stain on it. You know, that was a big moment for me. And that's when I learned that if I ask myself a question, I may get other guidance. But learning to differentiate my personality self and the guides was a process that I had to go through. You know, the guides don't care about, that I work with, don't care about the idiosyncrasies of my life for the most part. They're teachers. They're coming to teach. They're there for the bigger picture. Right. So uh, presumably you have your, your guides to help you navigate this earth school to you know be be the best version of yourself possible and get closer and closer to god and then you have these other guides that are the ones that are speaking through you to uh, affect more planet-wide change is that right i think there's an overlap i think you know my the guides that i work with that are teachers are there for that reason to teach i assume that there are personal guides too that are piping in. But for the most part, when I'm channeling, I'm doing very specific work. I think there is a, a misunderstanding among some people that if you can do this, you have access to all the information in the world. And every psychic would be winning the lucky numbers every day. You know what I mean? And they'd be reading each other's minds too. I don't know that it works that way. When the ego is invested in an outcome, it's not a healthy thing, I think, to try to read for yourself. Because you're going to either get what you want, hear what you want, which is risky, or you're going to, you know, get confused. And I just say, you know, the guides are teachers. I think they do support me in my growth and in my work with the teachings, and they certainly support me in this work. I'm very fortunate that way. But do they care if I get a date? Not necessarily. That's been my opinion. <laughs> not, not, not that bigger fish to fry than my personal life. Do you find that you also get messages or information through the environment? So, for example, what I'm finding is my as my psychic abilities are increasing i'm getting not just information through uh, the clairs clair audience is one of my primaries but also through the environment so I, I for example just saw a blue jay out the window a couple minutes ago and the sense i got about it was that was not random and it was something i was meant to talk about in the interview and these animals have messages for us and there's oftentimes a, a book or a website I'll be guided to, to unpack what that is. For example, Power Animals by Stephen Farmer or Animal Talk by Ted Andrews. And sure enough, when I read the page, either it's for myself or for the person I'm in conversation with, they're like, wow, that really hits home. Thank you. <laughs> that was like exactly what I needed to hear. So it, how does that work for you? It doesn't. It's not how I work. I'm pretty specific in what I do. I understand the abilities that I have as they're implemented. I'm not a trained medium or a trained channel. And I am grateful for how I've been developed, but it took a long time. I started opening up as a channel over 30 years ago now and didn't know what was going on or what to make of it. So it's been a process for me. But I don't seek things out. I mean, you know, I remember because I live in the jungle, you know, in a house with a lot of windows and occasionally the birds fly into the house or bump into a window. And I remember the first time a bird flew into the house, I went, oh, my God, what does that mean? And I looked up the meaning of birds flying into the house on the Internet, and it was all terrible. <laughs> I went, oh, great. It means somebody's going to die. Well, somebody somewhere probably did, but it wasn't anybody that I knew. And so I'm not looking in the ways that I used to for portents 
and seeking meaning in those ways. There was a time when I was developing when I would. And I think that that was a useful time for me. I was beginning to understand the idea of divine order, divine flow. But there's a, a, a line that I think sometimes people cross into magical thinking, which is, you know, I saw 11, 11, four times today. What does that mean? Well, it only comes twice on the clock every day. So four times, I don't know what it means, but it might mean something for you. And we do develop, I think, our personal systems of understanding things. I read in a specific way. I've seen other people who do readings that work in a comparable way. I saw some uh, film of Jane Roberts who channeled Seth channeling once and I recognized how she was working. It was like, yeah, that's what it feels like. That's what it's like. I've seen other people who channel and it's a completely different physical affect. And I go, well, that's how they're work with, I guess. It's just a different thing. So I have to just be open to the fact that everybody's getting their information in different ways. So at this point, I have not experienced the trance channeling where essentially like my vocal cords are taken over with my permission. That hasn't happened yet. I get a lot of our audience messages some clairvoyant visions or images. I'll get uh, a knowing, so clair claircognizance, clairsentience. It's, it's certainly developing. I'm open to being a trans channel. I just don't know when or if that's uh, going to occur. So you know, it hasn't occurred for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a conscious channel. I'm receded. There are things that I do that seem to be in alignment with a kind of physical mediumship. My eyes change color. Sometimes when I work, they go bright blue and I have, you know, hazel eyes. And when I step into people, I can somatize them. I mean, I've been filmed doing it with people that I've never met where I take on their, their physical challenges. But I don't offer the body and the vocal. I don't offer that up. You know, I studied with this old lady years ago when I was very young. She was a healing teacher. And she used to say, if you're not in your body, who is? So I understood the need to stay in the body and my abilities kicked in or began to kick in. I began to open up when I stopped drinking when I was 25 years old and I was doing everything that I could in my life to get out of my body, to check out whether it was, you know, booze or four packs of cigarettes a day, which I did for many years, food, which I'm don't, I'm not doing now and I'm happy about, but you know, these are all ways of sort of checking out. And for me to be effective in this work, I have to be present for it and here. And that's not to say that there aren't remarkable trans channels. I recall about a third of what comes through me, but I'm so busy keeping up with the dictation when I channel that if you were listening to it, you would have probably a better recall of what was said than I did as I was speaking. You mentioned if somebody... Uh, if somebody said that if I'm not in my body, who is? That reminded me of a concept I learned from my Kabbalah teacher. He explained to me the concept of an Eber, I-B-B-U-R. When a spirit kind of takes over you, um, possession, it's positive possession. And this can go on for quite a while or can just be very temporary. And one reason for this occurring is so that the soul who's piggybacking on you or along for the ride can perform a, a mitzvah or a good work or complete some mission that they weren't able to complete in their lifetime. Have you heard of this concept? And do you feel like you have any Ebers? Not my thing. It's an interesting teaching. I don't have an opinion on it. I have a concern at times that people that are opening up psychically or in you know, spiritually, suddenly just think, well, I get to be a radio and I'm going to play any station that wants to come through. And like any stations, there are some that are lower than others. And I think until people learn discernment, it's to be done with prudence and an awareness, you know. I mean, if you think of all the cable channels there are, there are some really spooky ones, you know, there's no need to go there. And I, you know, my guides say that, you know, everything is source, everything is God, just operating at different levels of tone, different levels of vibration, and anything can be reclaimed in the higher. But I do think that when somebody's opening up, the excitement or the glamour of 
the psychic work can be seductive in a way. And I think it was for me when I was very young, when I was opening up and I didn't know what to make of it. My life was falling apart in those days, which was really interesting to be opening up spiritually while your life is sort of in real disrepair. But what I was undergoing was a real renovation of self that I think has continued or I hope is continuing. But the initial excitement of all of that later became replaced with practicality because there comes a time when I suspect and, and will happen with you when it becomes more normal. You know, it's just like another way of being in the world. So I've learned to say if I'm sitting with somebody and my left foot begins to hurt and it wasn't when I sat down with a person, I may i be feeling their pain, their foot, their problem. And I've learned to ask, you have a problem with your foot? Yeah. You know, and then you go, okay, well, that's clairsentience showing up. I don't carry people's stuff. But when I first started opening up and those things started happening, I was alarmed and excited and, oh, my God, what's happening? And, and maybe that's what I needed to keep going forward. I needed some proof of some kind to encourage me to, to trust the phenomena. I think the challenge is, is that people can be seduced by the phenomena and not the substance, you know, and that's, that's got to be the key. Does it pan out? Is it helpful? Is it working? Other than that, it's just, it's just stuff. Yeah. And I think there's also an important distinction too, around paying attention to the message uh -huh. or the messenger. Yeah. And so if somebody is putting on a pedestal the messenger, then that becomes an intermediary to God. You're not relying on or establishing a direct connection with the creator. You're going through an intermediary, and that's dangerous, I think, um, on many levels. There are teachers, and I think there's all kinds of teachers and people teaching different things. I don't call myself a spiritual teacher, and I'm certainly not a guru. I'm a guy with a skill set that's specific, and I work with the skill set, and hopefully people are helped by it. But I don't want people projecting their stuff on me because I don't need it. I need like a hole in the head. It's not my stuff. I think that there are people that want that focus, but I think that there are hard lessons to be learned through that as well. You know, when somebody puts you on a pedestal, they're likely going to want to knock you down eventually. So speaking of which, do you ever get psychically attacked? I have. Can you tell us more about that? I don't like to talk about it much. I mean, usually it's been somebody who's holding a great deal of anger that's projecting it. It's, I don't perceive it necessarily as an entity. I think that, you know, thoughts creative. When I, the very first time I was interviewed on a cable show, right around the time of the first book, which nobody knew about, nobody knew who I was at all. Um, I was a college teacher in New York and there was this channel book with my name on it and I was on the show. And I was very, very heavy and I was rocking when I channeled back and forth. I looked pretty crazy and I knew it. And it, you know, I was like, okay, I gotta live with this. But when the, when the thing aired, there was ridicule. There was a lot of stuff that wasn't pleasant and I could feel it. You know, I still feel it when I do something now that airs and a lot of people see it. I usually can feel it when it's up because I feel the focus on me and I get uncomfortable. But I was really hurting. And I said to when this first one happened, I said to my guides, if you want me to do this kind of work, why are you letting this happen? And the response was very simple. Well, as long as you care what people think about you, it's going to be a problem. So you see, we've got to be at a certain level in, in vibrational accord with these things. And my attachment to how I was perceived or wanting approval or wanting to be liked was, was operative in a way. And I, you know, I don't say that it's all gone, but it's not what it was, you know, and I've been doing this publicly long enough that at least there's a body of work to support how I work and how I work is, is clunky and awkward in some ways. I'm not elegant. I'm not sitting there, you know, espousing. I'm taking dictation. So yeah, I've had the experience of it and I, it's not pleasant and I don't recommend it, but it's not a place where I like to hang out and you know, it's not my subject either. What if somebody is getting that psychic attack or criticism, scrutiny energetically from a, a detractor. Raise your vibration, lift, lift your vibration to a level where you're not getting hit with it. 
you've got to have a level of investment to be caught, I think, at that level. I mean, it's the old teaching of, you know, turning the other cheek, you know, really. I think that's what this is about, really, is you're lifting to a level where you're not, it doesn't hit you. They can throw the stones, but they're going to operate below. That's my sense. But again, this isn't my subject. Other people talk about this stuff. It's their subject. And I'm specific. If my guides teach it, I can talk about it. If I've had an experience with it, I can only talk to my own experience, not necessarily what other people should do. Because you have this kind of uh, area of specialization and there are other psychics and, and mediums and so forth who have other specializations. Maybe it's medical intuition or a certain healing modality or you know, whatever. And thus you end up maybe trading services w with a, a trusted gr group of, of friends with abilities. What sort of areas of focus or modalities do you tend to rely on friends in your in your network? Or is it medical intuition? No, not necessarily. I mean, I have a couple of people that I've traded with or worked with for many years, and I trust them. It's sometimes it's just like second opinion stuff. Well, I got two bids on solar. Which one do you think is the best one? You know, I mean, it may be that simple and that practical. I know what I seem to excel at which is my ability to step into other people and hear them. Now, I can do precognitive work, which, but I don't love doing it. It's not, but I have a friend and that's her thing. She's a good precog. And I have another friend, he does other things. He has, he does acupuncture, he does herbology. He has a context and a vocabulary for things that I don't. And so he can be useful in ways that I'm not. And I don't think that one is necessarily better. I don't do a lot of work with the dead. You know, it's not my thing. But I have somebody that I go to and refer clients to at times when they have somebody on the other side that they really need to clear some stuff up with. If you ask me to turn into a relative who's on the other side, I may get them, but I most likely get them while they were alive, when they still have the body. I'm really accurate when they still have the body. I've done accurate readings for people who have been in comas. Their families can verify the information, you know, or locked in syndrome, things like that. But once they don't have a body, it's like it's a different, different station. And if they want to talk, sometimes I will get it. That is not my work. It is not how I say, this is what I can offer you. Other people do, and that's appropriate for them, you know. They're just different ways of being expressed and different ways of of operating, I suspect, or, or, or being in service. Yeah. So when you say precog or precognitive, pre uh, for a listener who's not familiar with that, uh, that's basically kind of foretelling the future or seeing the future? Yeah, it is. I have a friend who reads the markets. She's effective. That's what she made her fame, doing that kind of work. And I don't do that, you know. Which I did, but I don't. Interesting. Do you do you hear God? Do you go directly to Him to talk to and share things with and receive information and guidance from? I mean, do I talk to God? Yeah, I do. You know, I do. Is that where the information I get is coming from? I expect an aspect or a way that one may receive information from source. When I was opening up and I was new, I, and before any of this new age stuff showed up in my life, which I didn't know about, I wasn't interested in it. You know, I had been really kind of bottoming out um, in a hotel in St. Paul when I, where I was there working for a few days and the Bible was in the drawer of this hotel room and I opened it up and said prayer for people in crisis and I said the prayer. And I was an atheist, you know, but I said the prayer because I didn't know what else to do at that moment. And three days later, I asked myself what I could do for myself that day that was positive. That was the question. I think I'd spent my last dollar on a glass of white wine the night before or something. And I heard a voice and it startled me. And it wasn't a voice in the room. It was a voice that blocked out. It was a thought that blocked out all other thoughts. It was like when you know something is true, there's no question. 
there's no question attached. And I listened to the voice and I stopped drinking. It was my, that was the beginning of a passage for me. I do think that going direct is the best. You know, people want to channel. The guides I work with encourage people move into their own knowing, true knowing, which is the aspect of the, of the self, the true self, they say, the divine self or the monad sometimes, the, the eternal self. They call it all kinds of things. But that aspect of self knows. And I think the idea to want to look outside the self is tempting. I was somebody that didn't even necessarily believe that much in channeling. And some of what I think is called channeling, I'm a little suspect of at times. I think inspiration is a wonderful thing, but inspiration and channeling, I think, can be different things. Inspiration, you know, there's a great inspired art and literature and the stuff is gifted, but it's then crafted. When I'm channeling, it's literal dictation. The books are unedited. There's three words maybe in any book that I have to go back and fix because I mispronounced the word. You know, or I was speaking so fast that I inverted the, the the and of. So the of as opposed to of the, you know. But that's about the extent of it, really. Once in a while, there's a word that I didn't know that they use. So I, you know, mangled it. But it's pretty clear usually because when I channel, I whisper and then repeat. It's usually heard on the whisper. The transcriptionist will catch it. So that's my sense about these things, but my experience is my own experience with this and other people's experience is completely valid and their own. So I don't remember where I started with this. I went on a little rant, so forgive me. No, this is fascinating. So you, you mentioned you were an atheist. What was that like for you versus uh, where you're at now? Well, I don't know. I mean, I say atheist, My and maybe we were agnostics, but my father who died when I was five, was a German Jew who you know, was a Holocaust survivor. He was shipped out of Germany and the kinder transport. And a lot of my family on his side didn't make it out. His immediate family did, but not most everybody else didn't. My mother, who I didn't know this until a couple of years ago, because I just always thought she was sort of an atheist, but it turned out she was quite religious as a child and then had a very bad experience with a minister who was supposed to be caring for her when she had no place to live. And so between the two of them, there was kind of nothing there in the house. I think they were both, I don't want to say disenfranchised, harmed, felt betrayed by whatever was out there. I was a home where we didn't talk about it. I didn't know what a spiritual life was. I was sort of interested in the occult and ghosts and things like that. You know, that was interesting. My father, I'm told before he died, became interested in the paranormal, but he died very young. And I think he was seeking evidence of something more. So basically I lived in a world where you kind of snickered at people who prayed over their food. You know, it was for people somewhere else. And I didn't know what a spiritual life was at all, or that one could have one, or why one would want one. I didn't know these things. When I was writing early on, I, I was always writing about transcendence without understanding that that's what I was writing about. And I think that there was a tremendous yearning in me for spirit. Where is it now? I take a lot for granted now. You know, I accept certain things that I could never have believed were so. And it's become part of my experience. I do believe that we are learning here. That this is all opportunity to learn. And some of the lessons aren't ones that I would have chosen for myself, at least at the level of personality. But am I religious now? No. I mean, there's a Jesus painting back there. But if you looked at my desk, which you can't see, I've got Hanuman here and there's Buddhas over there. I think it's all source. It is depicted in different ways and that there are different ways forward. The guides that I work with, their teaching seems to be a kind of esoteric Gnostic or Christian thing. It's almost like pre-Christianity. They say that the Christ is the aspect of the creator that seeks to be realized in form. That's how they describe it. And they call it the monad and other things as well. You mentioned leading a spiritual life. And I would love to hear more about how you put that into practice. What are some of the actions that you take on a daily basis that keep you 
connected and in flow and kind of climbing that ladder towards a, a closer and closer relationship to God? I don't know. I'm certainly not perfect, but I mean, they're basic things. Tell the truth. Don't lie. The guides say the action of fear is to claim more fear. Every choice we make in fear gets us more of the same. Lying is fear. They said there's never been a lie told that wasn't told in fear. So that's a simple one. They say again and again, you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. There's a lot of hypocrisy in spiritual communities, you know, and us versus them thinking and all a bunch of crap. It's been there since I opened up. It was going on when I was in my 20s, you hear. You know, the Reiki people don't talk to the Barbara Brennan people. The Barbara Brennan people, they said, didn't talk to anybody. The Reiki people didn't talk to the Mary L people. It was, there were all these little camps of healing communities. And, and it's all silly. It's all God. It's just different ways to practice and to learn. They call different people to them. They say that self-righteousness, they say, is always the small self. So when I'm feeling up on my high horse, that's usually an indication of where I'm coming from. So I try to try to monitor that, and not act on that. But a lot of it really is about how we treat other people. I'm an old 12 stepper and they used to say, look for the good or the God in everybody. That's a high spiritual teaching. It's so simple, anybody can do it. And this doesn't mean that there aren't people that I don't wanna see again. There are people I don't wanna see again and that's perfectly fine. God bless them, but that's fine. I've learned through this a fair amount, I hope, about being in integrity in your choices, boundaries, maintaining them in healthy ways, doing my best, living and let living, which is a fair amount of it, you know, it's, that's some of it. I avoid specialness, I suspect. I don't like investing in that. I just think that what I what I do as a channel is what I do. What you're doing here is what you're doing. The crossing guard is doing what she's doing. The man who's fixing the road outside. It's all different ways of being in this experience of being alive. And the idea that one is better than the other, I think, is still just an adherence to societal structures and beliefs of what is meritful and what is not. Thank God somebody's fixing the road. It's so interesting. You know, I was on Maui when COVID hit and there was this period where everybody in New York City, because I would watch it on the news because that's where my home still was officially. I just wasn't there. People were cheering the essential workers every day when they went to work. They'd be on their rooftops banging pots and pans. And I thought, how wonderful is that? that they're acknowledging people. But, you know, I don't know that that level of respect and honor has continued. Would you say that you live life like a prayer? No, maybe life is a prayer anyway, but am I always aware of that? No, it would be nice. Yeah, but you know, I'm human. I get worried, I get frustrated. It's part of it, but I gotta say, I'm so far beyond where I used to be in terms of how a life can be lived you know, and how I experience myself in the world in good ways, very positive ways. And I'm very grateful for those things. But have I ascended? I don't think so. And to be a little suspicious of people who announce that they have, because I think people that have probably don't need to announce it. Are you able to see the good in everything, not just in everyone? Like, for example, you mentioned how your parents were, were disenfranchised and you know, there's this adage that everything happens for a reason. Can you see that reason? Can you see the divine beauty of it? No, not always. I mean, I think that there are perspectives where one can. I can look back. You know, I came into my own spiritual life, the beginnings of it in the late 1980s at a time, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic in New York. Many of my friends were dying and dying fast. It was a train wreck of a time. Do I see the beauty in that? I see the compassion that arose in the community as they cared for people. I see the bravery in that community as people sought to correct injustice. I saw my own response, which was to 
learn a form of energy healing and help people in, in that way. I can say, well, there were benefits, but was was a time that I wish it happened? Absolutely not. So the guides talk about one of their claims is God is, God is, God is. I don't know that you get to have it both ways sometimes, and I think it would be nice to. I do believe that everything is holy, but that doesn't mean that everything is good in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, the guides say, the guides say there is one note sung in the entire universe, which is source. And that one note is actualized or in manifestation, in form and beyond form in different ways, in different tone, different levels of vibration, high and low. So the guy, I mean, I used to ask questions like this, and I suppose I still do, but you know, so if God is all things, what about the darkness? And they said, well, the darkness is of God too. It, it just denies it. It just refutes it. But you can't not be in source finally, because source is all things. So, I mean, it's a complex teaching and the guides go into this stuff at length in the books. I mean, they really go into this stuff and in ways that I grapple with still. I don't find that the teaching that comes through me is terribly convenient to what I want to hear. That would be nice, but it's just not. It's challenging. What do you find to be the most challenging? What are you grappling with the most that's one of their uh, kind of foundational teachings? I don't know that I'm grappling with the teachings per se. I grapple in my own life with my unwillingness to implement the teachings sometimes. And I'm much, much better with that. I grew up a worried child. I was very worried little boy, you know, sadly worried. And, you know, worry in some ways is one of my defaults. I can rest in this place of worry. It doesn't serve me anymore, but it's a way that I've known myself that's comfortable. And the fact that I'm not worried all the time is so remarkable, I can't tell you, but I can still, retreat to the known, the known worry, the known pain. And I have the tools, but I also have to say that I'm not one of these people who necessarily believes that this is supposed to be a swan book, swan book ride every day. I think there are challenges in life. Things happen that are hard. People get sick and die. There are wars. There are things that are deeply challenging. And I think that, you know, how I hold anything in consciousness contributes to that form. And I think that that's a big teaching of the guides. What you put in darkness, they say, calls you to the darkness. Who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. That's a teaching of co-resonance and entrainment. It's very simple. But it goes back to the idea you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. That's not always easy to do. But I understand what happens when I don't, which is I suffer. Think of it this way, what you damn damns your back. It's a real simple teaching. What you bless, and blessing isn't prayers and blessings and dismissal. The guides say to bless something is to realize, which is to know the presence of the divine where it appears to be lacking. You claim spirit where it has been denied. The guides I work with say the only real problem humanity has is the denial of the divine. And that's not a religious teaching. That's just where we deny source. And what we deny it with are all of the things that cause us pain. You know, it's the cause of, you know, poverty. It's the cause of war is fear. Fear is the denial of source. That's all. Do you consider it uh, different between source, spirit, and God? Or are those just um, interchangeable synonyms for God? People use them in different ways. That's all. So source is God to me. Spirit, I tend to experience as aspect of source, not source in uh, the one note song. But, you know, but, you know, and soul is soul. And these are all, I mean, but I think you can get caught up in the semantics. And I don't know that it matters so, so much. You know, the guys that I work with, use language at times that is rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I had somebody very well-meaning, I'm sure, write a letter once saying to me, you need to tell your guys to stop using those words because they're turning people off. And I thought, well, it's a channel text. They're going to say what they want. It's not up to me to me. I had somebody else 
who wanted all of the, the editors to go back and put all of the books in general neutral language, all of them. And it's like, I didn't write the books. It's not mine to change. They can do what they wish. And they're actually extraordinarily aware, I think, of how we can mess language up. So I think they're pretty cautious with it for the most part. But that's that. So I don't get, I try not to get caught up in the semantics. Again, my job is as a stenographer. I'm taking, I'm the radio that is broadcasting this stuff. I'm not selecting the language. Right. But they're using your language. If you, if you didn't speak English, they would use whatever your native English. They're using my vocabulary and occasionally beyond it because they, they've used words that I've never used. I knew it was a word. There's in, in one of the recent books, there's a lecture and they kept trying to say a word and they're saying, we're, you know, Paul, we have, we're saying a word and Paul is not repeating it or something to that effect. And I wasn't because I didn't think it was a real word. And I was like getting nervous because the rule with the books is I don't get to go back and change things. So as soon as the lecture was over, I said the word was penumbra, a word I've never, I didn't know idea what it meant. Everybody got their phones out, looked up penumbra in the workshop. This was at the Esla Institute. And I believe penumbra meant the light that shines from behind the clouds, the light that's visible from behind the clouds. It was the perfect metaphor for the entire chapter. <laughs> I didn't say the word. It's a footnote in the book now. So occasionally they exceed my vocabulary. But yeah, I mean, that's what they work with. You know, they work with the language that I speak. But uh, they've said, I'm sure, over the years, a number of things that I wish they hadn't said. I can't remember them, but I'm going, oh, brother, I don't believe they just said that. And, you know, that's what the teaching is. And that's what I end up living with and that's what's published in their books it's funny you mentioned penumbra because <laughs> i just got for my three-year-old son a book called the ultimate book of space and he loves that book and penumbra is in there as is umbra and it's explaining the difference between a, a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse the umbra is the the fully black part where the shadow of the earth is completely blocking the light of the sun. Whereas the penumbra, it's partial. It's like on the edges of the earth. Um, so it's just a, a little bit of sun coming through, but uh, partially blocked. So speaking of space, what's your view or your, your experience with extraterrestrials? It's not their teaching. I don't have experience with it. I believe in it. It's not what they're talking about. Somebody else goes there, and I'm sure goes there very, very well. Because there, there are these different channels and, and uh, psychics who connect to Arcturians or uh, Pleiadians and so forth, and uh, you, you've never communicated with them. Is that right? I know who I'm working with. You know, if some of them are from someplace else, I wouldn't be surprised, you know. They say some of us have been informed, some of us have not. I mean, you know, they're teachers. But no, I don't, it's not how it comes through me. And that's fine that it comes through other people that way. How about past lives? What's your, what's your feeling about that? I believe in them. Do you have a, uh, any glimpses of any of your past lives? Do you have any sense of how uh, un, unfinished business from past lives ha, ha, has spilled over into this life for you? Some. The one that I was given directly was uh, was interesting because uh, I was in my early 30s and I was on jury duty for the first time and I was very proud to do my civic duty and I began having terrible, terrible anxiety in the court. I mean, so badly that I didn't think I could stay there. And I kept thinking, I'm not the one on trial. What the hell's going on here? You know, this is nuts. And I was meditating a lot in those days and I was opening to channel. I wasn't fluid in those days, but I was hearing some and I kept hearing this name Mirandella. And then I finally heard, go look it up. And this was pre-internet. You couldn't just get on Wikipedia, you know, but I looked it up in a, an encyclopedia. And it was a philosopher in the Renaissance who had been on trial before the Inquisition for teaching the universality of all religions. So, and I heard, well, that's who you were. And late, and there was a dream that I had right around the same period of this 
chubby guy who was kind of gay looking to me with a big collar, big, big collar and a big gold cross and a little red beanie on his head. And this monk with his great big nose who looked kind of, you know, cowl, who looked very sad. And it was an odd dream about, you know, an arrest and martyrdom. And um, years later, you know, when the internet came, because I'm old enough to remember when there wasn't internet, you know, and I looked up on this guy that, that I'd been told I was. And the monks showed up on the Wikipedia page, which was interesting. So I know who they were, you know, and they were close. And they both came to difficult ends. But that's the one I know about that I actually give credence to. And because... I wasn't looking for it, you know, I wasn't, oh, hypnotize me and tell me who I was. You know, I think we can get caught up at times. There's a reason everybody says that they're Cleopatra, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's exciting, but, and somebody probably was, or we were all an aspect, or it doesn't really, I don't know if it really matters, but I think it's interesting information at times and other people really, that's their work. It's just not my work again. So I do believe in it. But it's my, when I work with people, I'm not doing past life readings. You know, rarely will I get information on that. The guy, I actually am of the belief that if you've got difficulties in this lifetime that are from history, they're going to make themselves known in this lifetime, and this becomes the opportunity. I think if we had to go back and fix everything from the past, we wouldn't be living in the present very much. When you do an interview like this, do you get nudges or information from your guides like, hey, pass this info on? <laughs> like, here's a message for you to pass on to your interviewer? No, occasionally somebody will ask, is there a message? But no, I don't. And I don't offer that unless I'm asked. You know, I find it, I've, I learn the hard way. You know, when I say, oh, I'm getting information for you, I, it's presumptuous to share something if it's not asked. And it's often unwarranted. So, and that was mostly about my wanting approval for being able to do this interesting thing. So I don't, I don't throw it up that way. If somebody asks, I'm often able to tune in, but usually there's gotta be a reason. You know, I was at a book signing once years ago in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, I was just talking and this guy raised his hand and said, this is all great, but do your guides have a message for us? And I said, I'll check. And they said, yes, we are not the entertainment. And that was all I heard from them. They were not the entertainment. I well, guess not. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, your guides are awesome. Uh, is there a message for, for me from, from your guides? I will ask. I will see if there is one. I hear you need to let yourself be who you are. You don't have to prove anything. You have to allow yourself to be. Cherish the one that you've come as. And don't expect him to be somebody he's not. The one you've chosen in this lifetime is perfect for you. Celebrate who you are in conscious awareness that who you are is who you need to be, period. That's what I get. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And, and thanks to your guides. Awesome. What a great way to close out this interview. So if our, if our listener or viewer is uh, wanting to learn more, what would you suggest as their first book to, to dive into that you've channeled? And also, where should they go to online to learn more? Well, my website is my name, paulselig.com. There's lots of information there and uh, links to upcoming workshops and live streams. As for the books... I, I suggest that people go as they're led. The very first book, I Am the Word, is in some ways a primer. The book that came out most recently, Resurrection, is also an interesting entry point for some people. It's a clean and coherent teaching. The books are dense. They're challenging. They're not beach books. Um, but I, they, the books are energetic transmission. So most people can feel the energy of the guides when they're working with the books and that's how it's always been and hope that's how it continues to be. Amazing. Thank you so much, Paul. It was uh, such an honor and pleasure to um, sit with you again and hear your, your wisdom and the wisdom that you've gleaned from your work with the guides and just authentic, 
uh, vulnerable sharing of your experience uh, in this life. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. And thank you, listener. Thank you for the willing suspension of disbelief. Thank you for being open to something that's unseen, maybe unproven, but still incredibly valuable and part of who you are. We'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.